OK, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to say good morning. Wait for it. And I'm not going to say it twice. You're going to get it right first time, OK? Have you all had some coffee? Yeah? OK, so you should be good. So good morning. That's more like it. Good. Welcome. I'm thrilled to be here. For those of you who don't know me, I am a software engineer working for Google in our London office. But I have to say, I am not speaking on behalf of Google. I will say, no doubt, stupid things that you won't agree with, or fantastic things that you might agree with. None of it's coming from Google, OK? It's all me. Uh, so I'm a Java software engineer who doesn't do any mobile application development. So what the heck am I doing up here? Um, more importantly, I'm an amateur C-sharp hacker, a massive fan of the language. And occasionally, I blog, and sometimes I write books. And just occasionally, I post on Stack Overflow. <laughs> so that's a little about me. And we have this morning a Canon in C Sharp. OK, um, right, too many Ns, N plus one error. We have a Canon in C Sharp as a musical Canon. So I don't know how many of you are musicians. I'm certainly not. But a canon is sort of a repeated melody. So there's one lovely melody which gets repeated in many voices at many different times. So there's a time delay. And often, you get some, some changes in the melody as you go along. So have we got any cellists here? That's probably for the best. So probably the most famous Canon is Pachelbel's Canon and Jig in D, and any cellist will go mad if you start playing. Because that's all they have to play, those eight notes, for the whole piece. They just play it again and again and again. Um, but the music up here is actually the, the first, it, it's bars three to six of the first and second violin part. And as you can see, you know, the, the blue notes on the first violin part get repeated in the second violin part while the uh, first violin part goes on to something slightly different. So the core idea of this talk is that this talk is itself a canon. I will be repeating some messages. Um, and it's about C sharp itself being a canon. I'll go into more detail in a minute when I've given you, you guys a bit of exercise. So Pachelbel's canon is probably the most famous classical canon, but the canon which, certainly in the UK, I really hope this happens in the US as well, the canon that every child knows is row, row, row your boat. You know, like that. So to get you into the spirit of that, we're going to sing that ourselves. So first time, I'm going to get everyone to sing it together. Then we'll split it into rounds. You have no idea how much I've been looking forward to this. <laughs> so we'll do it. I would do it in C sharp. But frankly, I didn't want to try to play in six sharps or whatever it is. I'm not a very good recorder player. But we'll do it in D. Bom, row, row, row your boat. OK, right. So one, two, three, four. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. OK, that was, that was OK. Not too bad as a first attempt. Right, so I'm now going to split you into four parts. <laughs> so originally, when I came in yesterday, I thought that there was one aisle down the middle, and that that would be brilliant, but no. OK, so. If you think you're roughly to the side, this side, OK, then you're on my left side. So we'll have part one is people behind the three big screens on the left side. Part two is people behind the screens on the right side. Part three, in front of the screens on the left side. Part four, in front of the screens on the right side, my right side. OK? And you start after the previous parts have sung row, row, row your boat. OK? I'm just going to sing row, row, row your boat four times, but pointing at the right places to go. This is going to work fine. <laughs> I foresee no problems here. OK. Everyone know what part they are. Part one, stick up your hands. Good. Part two, stick up your hands. Three, four, 
Hooray. OK. Bom. That's, that'll do. OK. One, two, three, four. Row, row, row your boat. Row, row, row your boat. Row, row, row your boat. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. OK, I could only hear myself, because you know, <laughs> there are speakers and things. Did it sound good to you? Yeah, give yourselves a round of applause. So one person singing that is, frankly, a boring song. Lots of people singing it in one part is louder, but still kind of boring. Many people singing it at the same time, at different paces, is what makes it interesting. And then you can get into all kinds of variations. But if you get anything wrong, it can cause issues. And I'll talk more about that later. So this talk, as I said, both the evolution of C-sharp as a platform and this talk have aspects of being a canon. The basic premise is that ideas from the C-sharp language team and other people, whether that's back in Microsoft or other places, these ideas percolate down over time. And the, a lot of these ideas started with computer scientists many decades ago. And they have to be passed on harmoniously. And the purpose of the talk is that the platform you all use is the result of a lot of hard work. And sometimes I feel we don't appreciate that enough. So what I want you to do is be inspired by this and realize just how much effort has gone into allowing you to create an app. So you're going to hear those two ideas repeated a lot, as is the want of a canon. Um, but just to set expectations, you will almost certainly learn nothing from this talk, OK? I feel this way. No one can come up to me afterwards and say, oh, yeah, I didn't learn much. Yeah, you won't learn anything, but hopefully you will change. OK, there's no point in a talk without change of some description. And hopefully it will be a change in attitude, a change of inspiration to go into the other sessions today thinking, wow, this is cool. What people have done for me already, what can I do with that? So. All great technical talks have a demo. And this is always the bit that goes wrong. So we've got a great AV team. I don't think I need any network today. I don't think I've got anything that can reboot. Um, so I'm going to demo my Android app. So we'll just have to wait a little while while it you know, warms up. Um, it used to take you know, a couple of minutes at this point, but now it's just the 17 seconds. Um, OK. so. Coming, coming. This is my Android app. <laughs> OK, right. So I've got this on my phone. You can have a look later on. OK, so uh, it's got a title and a button and a label. So I'm just going to click the button. And <laughs> these app developers always put the buttons in the most inconvenient places. It's terrible. OK, we'll just let's, let's assume I can click the button. And this happens. OK. We've got a date and time in an ISO 8601 compatible JSON format. Rah! OK, so that's the whole demo, by the way. Let's have a look at the code for it. And in particular, can anyone guess what date I put in for that uh, to, to get that up on the screen? No. Nope. I put in the 15th of Tishrei in the year 5,775 in the Hebrew calendar. <laughs> because I can. <laughs> and frankly, because that took weeks of work. <laughs> Let's have a look at what's on here. Just in terms of C Sharp as a language, we've got a type system. Okay, we all take for granted that there's a type system. But have any of you ever tried to design a type system? It's really hard. Then there's lambda expressions, anonymous types, implicitly typed variables. There's an event. There's an indexer. Um, a couple of lines before, we had a, an extension method. Language design's really, really hard. As any of you who have used a badly designed language would know, it's, this is something that should be left to the professionals. And even then, it's really easy to get it wrong. C-sharp is a very, very well-designed language. 
mad props to Mads, uh, one of the language designers who's here at this conference. They put in so much effort. The things that the language designers will debate, little tiny, tiny changes one way or another just to reduce friction. It's amazing. And then once you've designed this amazing language, you've got to specify it. Because otherwise, you know, without a language specification, there are languages that don't have specifications. I think for a while, Ruby didn't have one. And then finally, they realized, hey, it would be a really good idea if we stopped saying the implementation is the specification. And they finally got around to one, I believe. Um, and the C-sharp specification is insanely good. It's really, really well written. Now, that said, it's not perfect. And Mads definitely knows how much I love finding bugs in it. Every so often, if you look really hard, you can find bugs. Nothing gives me more pleasure. <laughs> but then, once you've got your language, you've got to evolve it. You can't just sit on your laurels and say, OK, it's done now. Life keeps changing, and the requirements keep changing of our industry. And adding new features to a language requires that it's been written well enough to start with that it's amenable to new features. And then you've got to add those new features in a way that keeps to the spirit of the language and is still easy to specify. It's really, really hard stuff. So once we've got our language, what else do we need? We need some kind of runtime. We've got something to execute this code. Now, for my Android demo, um, other than the PowerPoint runtime, um, I've got the Android runtime with Mono running with its JIT compiler. If I'd ported it to iOS, which would have been trivial, it would have been ahead of time compiled. On Windows Phone, it would have run on the CLR. And runtimes are really fiendishly tricky. And just to go back into the Java space briefly, if any of you have looked at Hotspot, the, the sort of fairly standard JVM, and the optimizations it can do, you know, ah, no, I don't think anything's going to override this method. I'll just, I'll inline it. It's fine. Oh, you've overridden it. Undo everything. It's crazy what some of these runtimes will do. Fiendishly hard. You've got threading. You've got garbage collection. You've got memory models. Hands up if you think you understand basically any of the memory models that are available. Good. That's the right answer. Oh, there was one there. Come and see me afterwards. Uh, maybe you do. A very, very few people really do. Um, and imagine if you've got language features which mostly work in a runtime, or runtime features that aren't supported by your language. That sort of impedance mismatch can be really, really painful. These things take a lot of effort and working together. OK, so I've got a runtime. I've got a language. Now I need some sort of core libraries. OK, we're going to need a string at some point. We're going to need some numbers. We're going to need dates and times. <clears throat> and the requirements of these core libraries, things that you would think of as core, that expectation has changed. I looked for the JDK 1.0.2 uh, documentation, and there are like four packages apart from java.awt. There's you know, lang, net, util, and io. And that's kind of all you can do. No XML parser. I'm not sure whether XML had even been invented when JDK 1 came out. But these days, you wouldn't launch a platform without an XML parser, would you? It's just, it's assumed it will be there. It's assumed there'll be a decent HTTP client. It'll, you'll assume all kinds of things. And the BCL's a pretty good core set of libraries. You know, not perfect, but it's pretty good. And some things like link and link to XML in particular are genius. Now, Link to XML is a brilliant, odd example here. Because if you look at any of the individual decisions in Link to XML, they make no sense at all. I'll, I'll just take object. It'll be fine. And then I'll do different things depending on the actual type. No, no, no. I'm in a statically typed language. I want to be able to specify these. Oh, no, it makes it really easy. I'm going to have all these explicit conversions to other things. And they'll just return null. It'll be fine. What? It makes it really easy. You've got XML namespace support that actually works. These things really matter to productivity. OK, so I've got my core platform. But if I want to write an app, I'm going to have to have a framework of some kind, something on which to mount my wonderful app. 
In my example, it was the Android framework obviously running under Xamarin. But this could have been Cocoa Touch or a Windows Phone app or Xamarin Forms. And that's just on the mobile side. You've also got Windows Forms, WPF, uh, maybe Silver, Silverlight. Um, Silverlight's still dead, right? Just I, I can never remember. Um, and then when it comes to web frameworks, you, know, you can barely swing a cat without finding a new web framework out there. And frankly, if you haven't written a web framework and a dependency injection container by the time you're 30, then you know, what are you doing with your life? Because <laughs> you know, what, what .NET really needs is a new dependency injection container. OK, so frameworks are incredibly important. And the choice of framework that you use will affect how you write your app, undeniably. It guides and at the same time it constrains the app developer, which means if you're in the position you're trying to build a framework, you've really got a heavy responsibility. Your opinions are going to change what other people can do and what they will do. You're going to be enforcing your ideas of encapsulation, your ideas of how the data will flow around the application, which bits of the app should know about other things, how testable it is, all of these things, as a framework developer, they're kind of under your control. Next up in the stack is class libraries. OK, so my sample application used JSON.NET and Node Time. How many of you have used JSON.NET? OK, pop your hands down. How many of you have used Node Time? We have a few. Good. How many of you have faced problems with date and time and time zones? Now, that's interesting. That's far more people than have used Node Time. Yeah. Node Time, the library that I have slaved for literally years over, it has sucked so many hours from my time. If you want to know anything about the Hebrew calendar or bizarre time zones or the bizarre way that Windows handles its own time zone data, you know, come and see me afterwards. But if not, uh, please go and check out Node Time. It really, if it doesn't make your life easier when facing date and time issues, then you can complain to me, definitely. But seriously, class libraries, it, it would be a rare application that didn't use any class libraries other than you know, the core framework you're using and the BCL. You're unlikely to get very, very far. And these class libraries are often really a labor of love, particularly the open source ones, obviously. You know, there's someone doing this usually in their spare time, and you're trusting them, which is in itself a pretty heavy responsibility. Your commercial application depends on someone else's free time. But they have put so much love into it that you can be confident in it. But again, if they decide, oh, blow it, I'm going to write a class library but I don't like the .NET naming conventions. I'm going to name all my methods as if it were Java. How many of you would want to use that class library? No. The idioms and conventions that the language designers and the framework designers have come up with, they flow down. They flow downstream, much like the boat. And everything works harmoniously if everyone's thinking along the same lines. And then at the very top of the stack is your application. I mean, unless you wrote 2048, then that's not your application, but the code that you've written. Now, as I said before, I am not an application developer. I don't have the knowledge, and I, don't have, I certainly don't have the UI design skills. You know, this slide deck is the pinnacle of my design skills. You should be very afraid. So often, the app is the smallest part in terms of code. You know, my tiny app was only you know, 12 lines of code, I think I actually wrote. But even larger apps, you know, real apps, are probably far, far, far smaller than all the code within the frameworks and the class libraries and the BCL. But what do you think it is that the users are going to complain about if it's wrong? If there's a bug in the class library you're using, or you're using it slightly wrongly, are your users going to say, do you know what? You shouldn't be using JSON.NET. 
No, they're going to say, your app sucks, one star. On the other hand, if your app gets it all right, are the users going to say, yeah, he wrote a really good small bit of code on top of everyone else's? No, they're going to praise you, bask in the glory of everyone else's work. Fundamentally, the app is the difference between users having nothing on their home screen and them having delightful apps that they will use again and again, that will make sure no one is ever bored, no one is ever lost. Everyone can find out all the information in the world. You can do anything. So far, I've talked a little bit about the, the stack itself in terms of what will be running. But there's a lot that goes on that's absolutely required that is not part of the execution stack itself. We need IDEs, compilers, debuggers, designers, test platforms, analytics. Now, yesterday, we heard about fantastic things that Xamarin's doing. And I certainly don't want to take anything away from that. But there's a lot more work out there that all of us are depending on or will depend on. And I want to give a shout out to Roslyn as a fantastic example of this. This is a project that Microsoft has sunk hundreds of years of human effort into, if not thousands, to make an API-first compiler. What's the good of an API-first compiler? Well, we can compile stuff, and they can build extra features into the language. And, and you can build your own amazing metadata programming languages that then boil down to C sharp. Or you can write your own um, diagnostics for your particular code conventions. I'm going to have something like this in no time. There are a few places where I do something that you wouldn't expect to see in C sharp. And I've got a little attribute to say, you know, don't worry, this is deliberate. And now I want to test that I'm not abusing that. So I really need to understand my code in a machine way so that I can check that I'm not doing anything wrong. Roslyn gives me that. It gives me the semantics, the control flow, the data flow, all kinds of things. This is an incredibly powerful platform. I don't know whether any of you have been to csharppad.com. If you haven't, go later on when you've got a decent Wi-Fi signal. It's online C Sharp in a web, in a web view with IntelliSense, all powered by Roslyn. Amazing stuff. So all of these features have come together for us to build cool stuff. How lucky are we? There are some of these ideas, some of these idioms that require collaboration right from the very start. So generics. You can't easily put generics into a language unless the runtime supports it. I know this. I write in Java. There's no point in having generics if none of your collection classes support generics. So often, there's a lot of collaboration between the language teams and the CLR teams and the BCL teams. But innovation certainly doesn't end there. When Dynamic came along in C Sharp 4, that was, if I say intended, there was no restriction that, that the C Sharp team were putting on this. But there was an idea that it would be primarily used for com interop. OK, for talking to Office and things like that. And indeed, it works brilliantly there. But it's also been used in dozens of other places. ORMs have picked it up voraciously. There are all kinds of you know, tiny ORMs um, that do all kinds of interesting things with Dynamic. And MVC uses Dynamic uh, when you want it to all over the place. Innovation doesn't stop at the language team. But it has to be in sympathy with in the same style as, along the same, moving down the same path as other people have intended. These features percolate through the stack, often taking quite a long time to do so. You know, we have this delay up here of you know, the green arrow taking a while to work its way all the way down to the bottom before actual app developers get to use it. As much as anything else, because you know, we, we get the CTPs, how many of you are happy to build apps that you're going to release on CTPs? Yeah. So you know, just the physical act of getting it all into production takes a long time. And then you've got potentially your own corporate delays 
You know, oh, we've got to test that this new version works out. But it all trickles down. All of this work that other people have done, so long as everyone is pulling together. When a message, when a concept, when an idea, a new way of doing things is well designed, well implemented, and well communicated, and it needs all three, it's a beautiful thing. If it's not well communicated, or maybe it wasn't well designed to start with, well, things go pretty badly wrong. If we'd started off singing, suppose I'd had all four parts singing beautifully, and then I'd started singing over the top in a different key. It would have been ghastly. If I brought part two in, while part one was you know, two thirds of the way through the first line, it would have sounded ghastly. If any core language platform values are misrepresented or abused, and believe me, I know about C-sharp abuse. I love it, but not in production. We end up with a big, big mess. And so, you know, I've been a bit of a cheerleader. I, on my initial slide, I was asked to put, you know, what's your title? It's like, Java software engineer. It's not really going to do it. So I put C-sharp cheerleader, because that's my job for, this, for today. Having been a cheerleader for the rest of the talk, I do have a few gripes, and it's great to just air them in front of a 1,000 people. So do any of you write PCLs, pickles? Yeah? Do any of you find the whole profile thing ever so slightly confusing? <laughs> yeah? Um, anyone writing an app uh, that depends on various Nuget packets, packages? Um, Ever had any version conflicts? Yeah? Any of you, uh, now this is possibly a little more niche, any of you write open source software and publish some API documentation? Sandcastle's where it's at. I think we can do better. I would really like to hope so. Now, just to be clear, I, I'm not announcing fixes to any of these problems right now. I'm saying I've identified that there are problems, and I would like to be part of the fix. Whatever that means. If that's giving feedback to other people who've come up with great ideas, great. If it's just giving feedback that, hey, this sucks, we need to do something about it, that's fine. We are a community. Microsoft stacks often get treated as if there is no community. And I've been to enough conferences and enough user groups to say that is complete hogwash. We have a fantastic community. And as a community, we can effect change. Whether that's through direct action, coding, you know, maybe you do want to write the next dependency injection framework. Maybe you want to think really carefully about how pickles can manage their versions and their uh, dependencies better. Maybe we can give feedback to Microsoft on, you know, I love Roslyn, but I really want to do this, and it feels like it's too hard. There are things we can do. So I'm going to run the demo again. But before I do, just take 30 seconds to think about the thousands of human years, tens of thousands of human years of effort that were required for me to write the 12 lines of code that power all of this. We've got a language, a runtime, core class libraries, a framework, third-party libraries, tool chains, and my 12 lines of code. Let's go again. Let's click the button. It's amazing! <laughs> this really is amazing that it worked at all. So to sum up. There are lots of very, very smart people. They have done a lot of hard work that lets you write amazing apps. OK, yesterday we gave huge rounds of applause for Test Cloud, Android Player, Insights, and that's all completely fine. But remember, there's stuff like that going on all the way through the stack. So I want you to do one or both of two things. Firstly, you can appreciate how lucky you are to be building on this phenomenal stack and appreciate it to the extent that you build wonderful apps that will delight every user 
and give some really magical experiences to people the world over. The opportunities are absolutely immense. Or contribute to that stack yourself. Build another open source project. If you're writing some commercial app and it's got one funky bit that needs to do something that's, you know, that's not really part of what the app's about, but it's really neat. Other people could use that. Release it. Bring it into open source. Download the latest Rosin CTP. Give it a spin. Try it out. Give feedback. Give feedback to Xamarin about all their latest bits and pieces. Work with them. Be a community. You are giants standing on the shoulders of giants, standing on the shoulders of giants. It's giants all the way down. <laughs> Go do amazing stuff. Thank you. <laughs>